All right, so let's talk about some of the current challenges. And we'll kind of circle back to this uh, population and food supply in a moment. But I do want to introduce another concept, and I'm going to be short about it. But um, throughout this course, we're going to be talking about globalization. And this is the increasing integration among places, that the world has become sort of a smaller place over time um, um, through social, um, economic, these are showing some of these kind of American brands in other countries. And the idea is that we've become much more interdependent on each other in terms of, of trade and, and our economies, um, for better or for worse. So if you have economic problems in one part of the world, that sends shockwaves to other parts of the world as well. So we'll be talking about globalization uh, throughout the course. So I had to put this somewhere. Uh, but I want to go back to this idea of being able to feed our growing populations, particularly populations in less developed countries. And, you know, back during the Cold War, after the 1940s, 1950s, um, there was real concern about being able to feed all of the people in developing countries. And in the United States, we had a highly industrialized type of farming where we use science to grow, you know, to really grow, um, increase our yields and, and, you know, do a lot more farming with fewer people. And so the Green Revolution was something during the Cold War with the United States to try to make allies, really brought a lot of its technology to other parts of the world to try to increase their food supply and feed more people. And so let's just kind of let's kind of keep go back over a few terms that we've talked about. We've talked about the agricultural revolution or Neolithic revolution where you had domestication, you control the breeding and cultivation of plants. And what's happening here is that, you know, over thousands of years, humans control the evolution of plants. So for example, this is Teosinte grass in Mexico. And, and this doesn't look a lot like corn, but it's from the Teosinte grass that people over thousands of years have selected different, you know, the best varieties until they've come up with modern corn. So humans have hijacked the evolution of the Teosinte grass. We also have the industrial revolution and technologies and trade make big changes in agriculture. We, we, we move from what's called subsistence agriculture, where we grow the food simply to feed it to our families to commercial agriculture where we're growing food to sell it in the marketplace. We'll be talking more about that in the semester. And the idea is that with commercial agriculture is that you grow more stuff and make higher profits. But there are side effects from this that we should be aware of that not every variety of every type of food is the most profitable. So when perhaps a hundred years ago, you might've had you know, 307 varieties of sweet corn uh, nowadays, you have 12 varieties because the, the ones that are not those 12s were not the most profitable, and so people just start you know, really stop growing them. So over time, we're really bottlenecking the types of food that we're growing. And one reason that may be of concern is that some varieties of food may be better adapted to future conditions. And when we talk about future conditions, you know, the, one of the obvious things to be, we could worry about is climate change. And so I want to just briefly introduce the concept of climate change. And, and I just want to use an illustration. You, you may notice that um, if you park your car in a parking lot, you got your windows rolled up and the sun is going shining through the windows, you have the, um, the windows that are transparent to the sunlight. So it's able to kind of get in there, heat up the car but the car can trap the heat inside and it'll be much more hotter inside the car than outside. You open the door and whoosh, a lot of heat comes out. And a similar con thing is happening in our atmosphere that you have what's called shortwave radiation. It's because the sun is hotter than the earth. So sunlight is a different kind of radiation that's warming the earth. Um, but as the earth warms and it gives off heat back out into space, is something called long wave radiation. And the two kind of are different from each other. And so short wave radiation is what's going into your car. Long wave radiation is what, what's being trapped inside your car. And the same is happening 
for the Earth as a whole. Why radiation is just heat, right? So this is what's called the greenhouse effect. This is about the slowing the release of heat from the Earth because of the presence of greenhouse gases, which are acting like the windows on your car. So while the shortwave energy from the sun can easily make its way in, the heat that builds up in the earth can't easily make its way out. And these are due to being kind of held back by greenhouse gases. And the two main greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide and water vapor. We don't talk much about water vapor because um, carbon dioxide is really where the concern is because humans, when we burn things like gasoline or coal, we add to the amount of carbon dioxide. But what people didn't know for a long time is, you know, how much carbon dioxide is there on the Earth and how much should there be? All right, so we know carbon dioxide plays a role in warming the atmosphere, but we just don't know what the status of carbon dioxide is. Right? So in the 1950s, a scientist named Keeling um, started an observatory high in a, on a volcano. Uh, it's called the Moana Loa. Moana Loa. Uh, volcano high on a mountain in, in Hawaii where you don't have a lot of influence from cities and highways to measure the amount of carbon dioxide and when they first started running it it was kind of going up and down they thought there might be some errors turns out that these are seasonal differences happening here but what was more alarming is they figured out that it is working but that the levels of carbon dioxide are going up the, they were looking at this trend of rising carbon dioxide level it's called the mono on the lower curve. Now, one thing they didn't know is how far back that goes because they only started measuring in like the early, late 1950s. So one thing scientists began to do is start to look at ways to measure the carbon dioxide we've had in the past. Now they did so doing using tools like uh, ice cores. They dig very deep into ice and that can be like a weather record. <clears throat> over time uh, because um, within the ice air are trapped air bubbles that can contain carbon dioxide so they can measure carbon dioxide levels going back thousands and thousands of years so here they've actually gone back this is the furthest one in dome c they've gone back 800,000 years also been able to use uh, measurements of the the water to um, detect the temperature along with those times one pattern is that when carbon dioxide levels are high Temperatures tend to be high. Um, not always clear if the temperature causes the carbon dioxide or the carbon dioxide causes the temperature, but the, the two are correlated. Um, but let's kind of zoom into more of the modern time. So this is the Mauna, Mauna Loa curve that we looked at a moment ago from Hawaii. And this is ice core data. We can kind of bring it back just a little ways to around say 1750. And the thing that's notable here is that this gives a more complete picture that in 1750, the, the, the amount of carbon dioxide was fairly stable. And then it's after that, it starts to rise and then kind of continues to rise more sharply. So um, what was happening around 1750? Industrial Revolution. And so the Industrial Revolution where people are burning coal and nowadays we're burning gasoline, it's really causing that rise in carbon dioxide. And like I said earlier, that's why we focus on carbon dioxide and less on water vapor because really humans aren't really changing the amount of water vapor. We are having a severe impact on the amount of carbon dioxide, which again, it's a greenhouse gas. Okay, so that's where, you know, that's really just kind of climate change in a nutshell. But a couple of things I want to clarify is that um, it's not just about the earth getting warmer, that the earth is a complex climate of the earth is very complex and changes aren't going to be uniform. Some places are going to be impacted more than other. Um, but also more importantly, that temperature is related to precipitation. So if you have changes, if the earth temperature patterns are changing, the rainfall patterns are going to change as well. And that's very important because there's a lot of the earth that depends on that, including the Central Valley, that depend on a certain uh, precipitation pattern like snow in the Sierra Nevada or rain in the summertime to um, further I'll include a video on this and it's be you know in in some ways there's enough concern over future changes that 
people have been starting to try to make a backup of our food supply. There were seeds from different varieties of foods that have um, that could be endangered in the future are being stored in a global seed vault that's up in the Arctic. I'll include a video on that. So this is a real concern about, you know, long term, how changes in our climate can impact our food supply, which, which we need for a growing population. So we can kind of put this together in, um, in a couple of different ways to look at it. One thing we might look at is what's called a Malthusian scenario of people versus resources. Sorry, I covered that up. And Malthus was a writer from, who was in, alive during the Industrial Revolution. And he had a famous paper that he wrote about where he looked at the growth of population versus the growth of resources. And he saw the population was growing like this, but it looked like resources were growing like this. And he had theorized that we were gonna reach a crisis point where there wasn't enough food for people to, to live. And that would be a crisis point. So this is called a Malthusian scenario, but we're worried about too many people, not enough food. That's one way to look at things. And by contrast, there's what's called a technocentric view of it. And this is, um, the idea here is that, well, yeah, we have a rising population, but over time, the resources will keep up. We're clever people. We will find new technologies, new ways of feeding all of these people. And so. These are kind of the big picture concerns about the earth as a whole when it comes to population. And we'll kind of look at this. We want, I want to introduce that now to give us kind of a lens as we look at different regions of the world. Now, one thing I should note, I've noted earlier, I'm going to go back, is that we have these question marks of where, you know, is the population going to land? And um, I'm going to include a video that you know, while the population is growing rapidly right now, it's expected to level off at some point, probably around 10 or 11 billion people. And then population growth will slow because birth rates will slow down. And so, well, um, but until that happens, until our population growth really starts to slow down dramatically, we have to be concerned about resources, not of people, protecting our food supply and protecting it while changes like climate change are happening around us.